<laughs> for coming. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I knew what the topic was a good while ago. No one asked me what it was, so I didn't tell them. And then I uh, uh, saw so it listed as a surprise, and everyone was signing up anyway, which is <laughs> really a wonderful, wonderful thing. So you all came expecting something. You just don't know what that something is. That's cool. <sighs> so I'd like to start out by uh, thanking uh, uh, LinkedIn for uh, uh, hosting us. This is really magnificent service uh, to the community to give us this space and this uh, 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 time uh, and the sponsors for this evening. So thank you all for putting this together. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes the Python world from uh, some of the other languages that I've uh, worked with is uh, the community. Uh, I'm spending uh, some of my spare time now in uh, I like to research interpreters for other languages, so I go learn the language, I read all of the internals of their interpreter, and then if they have some good ideas, I steal them and then put them into uh, the core of uh, uh, Python. And good news is sometimes they have some great ideas and we're able to uh, uh, build on top of that. Bad news is not all of their communities are uh, like ours. I'm uh, the uh, interpreter that I'm working with right now. I've gone out to the, uh, the, the news group and it is not vile, but it is a couple steps above that. So this is a very magnificent group. I'm not sure you know how special uh, uh, this is. So again, I wanna thank the sponsors and thank all of you for uh, uh, coming together uh, uh, tonight. So you're probably wondering what the uh, uh, topic is. I might as well get that out. It's uh, usability testing. And the idea is we build stuff. We're engineers, we make things for use by other people. We'd like to put good engineering concepts into this and say, we've got some education, we've done some planning, we tried to make something good. Does that necessarily mean that when you put it in the hands of somebody using it, that it's going to be any good? It might fit or might not. It turns out users often think about the world quite differently than the way uh, developers uh, uh, think about them. And so users can use things in a different way. Things that make perfect sense to a person designing tool may make no sense at all to a person using it. Also, sometimes the skills that it takes to design something put you way out of touch with your users so you have no idea how they're going to think about the problem or what the needs actually are. A challenge that we have as uh, Python core developers is that a number of the people in the core developer group have some extraordinarily good C programming skills, and yet I think they may, may have never met a Python user ever, which means that they can design things that are really brilliant pieces of craftsmanship, but are quite out of touch with uh, people's needs. Uh, I mean, it's never happened to me, of course, but, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd actually like to suggest that it goes the other way around, that in fact, all of us are in this position that it, we suffer from when you get into designing something, you come to live that thing and experience it. It becomes a part of you and the effort you put into it separates you from the rest of the world. You come to love that thing, it's your baby, you know how it works. And so almost by definition, the person who makes something becomes out of touch uh, with their users. So should you just make the best thing you can and publish it? Or should you actually talk to these people? Talk to these uh, 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 people. So I'd like to take you through an example of something that was proposed for the Python standard library. Uh, how many of you have heard of uh, the transform dict or the collections module? Oh, fair number of you uh, I have heard of it. So uh, that's fantastic. Uh, the last time I mentioned this in a large group of people, no one had uh, heard of it before. And so it was proposed to go into the standard library. It was made by a famous Python core developer solving a real problem uh, and had a good inspiration and some reasons for designing uh, this tool. So they put it together and then went through several iterations refining it. By the time it arrived to the Python uh, dev mailing list, this code worked. This code had good tests. This code had documentation. It had an inspired design and was created by a, uh, a person who was really good at Python uh, programming and had been a core developer for a long time. And so it was discussed on the Python ideas list and on the uh, Python dev list. And it gained a lot of uh, uh, supporters. A lot of people liked it. Is that a pretty good sign for the transform dict? That should be an excellent sign for it. 
but what is one thing about what I described to you as the process at that point that worries you when I say this thing is a good thing because an experienced Python core developer made it, they had a reason to do it, they had a problem that they were trying to solve, they had worked it out, they had done tests, done documentation, discussed it in some forums amongst other uh, uh, senior developers in Python ideas and Python dev. Uh, is there anything that worries you at this point? Oh, for mediocre <laughs> <laughs> hmm. That's a great question, Anna. I'm wondering that myself. <laughs> the answer is, I don't care. <laughs> I truly don't care. What do I do for a living? I'm a Python consultant and trainer. I have trained thousands of engineers. Personally, I've trained about 6,000 uh, uh, engineers, and my team of trainers has cumulatively trained about 14,000 engineers. A lot of people. I don't care about mediocre programmers, because if they come to me, I turn them into excellent programmers. I'm a manufacturer of good programmers. To me, a mediocre programmer is just raw material for I put them in my machine, and outside, uh, a good programmer comes out the other side. So I truly don't care about them. So who do I care about? I care about the good programmers who are going to need this uh, tool. So if you're good and you're smart, surely you're going to know how to use it right and you're going to make correct predictions and it's designed exactly for you. Is that the case? No, the problem with what I had just described with the process before is we didn't have users involved. And the uh, Python core developers are not good examples of users. We know the internals, we, we are interested in a lot of things that normal people aren't interested in. How many of you like working for money? <laughs> oh, you would not make a good Python core developer. <laughs> Although I should say there are certain perks to my job. I've been doing Python core development for almost 17 years and every single year, Quido has doubled my salary. How many of you uh, have perks like that? Okay, it's true. One time I put a bug in the code and he cut my salary in half, but it didn't hurt as much as you might, uh, might think. So uh, two to the 17th power times zero is my magnificent salary as of uh, today. I have put years of work in with uh, uh, no pay. So already, if you were a core developer, you're a weirdo. You're a person who likes to do lots of work, possibly on things that you don't care about, in service for other people, fixing other people's bugs, and trying to make nice release year after year after year instead of spending time with your family and going out earning money and now uh, making the world a better place. So already core developers are a little bit of a mutant. How many of you like uh, programming in Python? How many of you like programming in C? <laughs> no, I said like it. <laughs> okay, how many of you like debugging in C? I didn't think so. Okay, fair enough. So. Uh, a lot of the Python core developers are very strong C developers. Is that typical of all the Python users? It's not, so it's atypical. So I'd like to take you uh, through a design review process. In particular, I wanna take you through the actual process uh, uh, that I use. I try to really step out on a limb this time and say, suspend my judgment and stop saying, I like this thing or I don't like this thing. It's so tempting to say, I like it, oh, that's cool. Oh, that sucks, throw it out one of those two things, and instead going to talk to uh, users. And so what do you do if you're a professor? Well, it's very easy to get a, a user group. You torture your students with it. <laughs> oh, what do I do for a living? I'm a trainer. So I'm my classes, uh, uh, there's almost always a case study in either the advanced class or the intermediate class. And so uh, the people I teach to are not beginners. They are working professionals using Python to solve real problems, trying to sharpen uh, other skills, and they make great test subjects because they are our actual users. And so what is it I was teaching them? I'm teaching, I was teaching them what I'm teaching you uh, now, which is a design review process of how to decide whether something is good or not. How many of you think that sounds like a useful thing to do? and particularly suspending your own judgment and applying other people's judgment. Now I need some uh, volunteers. Uh, who is my most expert uh, Python person in the room? Okay, who's pretty darn good? Oh, come on, don't be shy. Who's slightly better than average? That should be at least half of you. <laughs> All right, put it up. Who would like to volunteer to be on my panel 
to answer some questions in the very near future. Jeff, are you up for it? All right. An excellent volunteer. Anna, are you up for it? Anna Ravenscoff, we are uh, honored to have her uh, uh, present tonight. Daniel, Miss Ricky, are you here? Daniel Song. Okay, so Daniel is here and he is also a, a, a volunteer. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Daniel uh, uh, teaches well with my company, so he is a top-notch uh, Python uh, user. So these three people have something in common. They are expert Python users. They are some of the very best on the planet. And so when I ask them questions, they should all be able to get 100% correct. Is that true? <laughs> I'm not going to be able to stump my panel. I have no interest in stumping my panel. When you are a volunteer for my panel, I should tell you something in advance. There are no wrong answers. I am, I am going to make judgments based on your answers, but I'm not judging you. I came to judge something else. If my experts can't answer a question correctly, it is not their fault because they're, I already know that they are great programmers. So if they get something wrong, it tells you that there's something wrong with the question itself. Don't you agree? <laughs> Catherine, would you like to volunteer to be on my panel? Say yes. <laughs> All right, fair enough. So uh, there's going to be a pop quiz coming up. And if my volunteers actually stop volunteering, which has been known to happen in the past, the rest of you can all chime in and give answers. So I'm going to show you something, teach you something in a way that it was intended to be taught, not in the way that I would normally teach it. And there's going to be a quiz. You didn't expect that at the, uh, the, the meetup, did you? All right, so uh, here's my company, Mutable Minds Inc., in case you guys want to uh, uh, hire me for corporate training or uh, whatnot. If you want to send me love letters, uh, here, okay, or hate mail or whatnot, uh, LinkedIn, thank you for inviting us. And let, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the Transform Dick. So I'm gonna try and not so much talk from the text as uh, just tell you a little bit about the concept of a Transform Dick. So a famous Python core developer was working on uh, an idea. He needed for doing some internet -y work with uh, headers for HTTP, the headers need to be case insensitive and they need to be stored in a dictionary. Regular Python dictionaries are case sensitive. If you store something in all uppercase and later you look it up in lowercase, it's not going to match. And it turned out this need has arisen uh, before. And we have to keep that information around and try to transform it as little as possible. The rule on the internet is when you're making a proxy, if you have to modify the data, you make the minimum modifications possible and pass everything else through unmodified so that you don't introduce uh, bugs into the system. Does that sound reasonable to you? So it turns out if you look at the request library, inside it is a case insensitive, case preserving dictionary. Why is it in request? Well, because they need it for processing HTTP headers. In fact, if you look in a number of uh, uh, libraries, you will find case insensitive, case preserving dictionaries. Does it sound like a good idea given that several famous uh, tools have it? In fact, it does. We know there's a legitimate use case and it's been reinvented several times. So that's a really good starting point for a transformed dictionary. Now, when you uh, go to solve a problem, if you want to solve a specific tiny little problem, one specific way that can be used one way, or do you want to solve it in a general way that solves all the world's problems and provides health care to all and peace in the Middle East? <laughs> How hard could it be? Hashtag winning. Fair enough. You guys want the special purpose solution that's wimpy or a general purpose solution? General purpose solution. So here was the idea. We knew that we might want a case insensitive case uh, preserving dictionary. We knew there were use cases for it. But if you put that in Python, uh, once it goes in the standard library, people are going to come back and say, all this thing is good for is saving uh, uh, the case of strings in a case insensitive way. I want to do some other transformation. So what we should do is remove hardwired behavior. Don't you agree that functions are better off if you factored out the hardwired behavior and let users customize it? So in fact, that's a quite reasonable thing. How about the transformation that it makes, uh, making it uh, all lowercase? What if you could plug in that transformation and have it make any type of transformation? 
That was the inspiration for the uh, transform day. We remember, we know this is a good idea because we've seen it implemented before. We know that there's an, uh, a use case for case insensitive case preserving, and we know it's a good idea to make a more general purpose tool, and we know it's a good idea to remove hardwired behavior. Is this a fairly inspired uh, idea? In fact, it is. Now, what about uh, variations of dictionaries? We have lots and lots of variations of dictionaries in the uh, collections module. How many of you have used chain map? Oh, I'm so sad. I love the train map. It's one of my favorite uh, uh, tools. So if you haven't che uh, seen chain map, you should go look. How many of you use chain map and think it rocks? <laughs> okay, it's my favorite tool in the uh, uh, collections module. How many of you have used default dict? It's a great uh, uh, tool. Quido designed uh, uh, that one. Apparently a little more popular than my uh, uh, chain dick. <laughs> okay, how many of you like order dicks? Oh, okay, that was me. <laughs> All right, so uh, what are these things? They are variations on a dictionary that have some extra property. The extra property of a default dict is that uh, it supplies a default value by running a uh, factory function. The special ca uh, a chain map is a kind of dictionary that links several dictionaries together and gives you a view of them to where they're effectively uh, uh, one. An order dictionary is the same as a regular dictionary, but it remembers uh, insertion order. Does it make sense that we want some specialized versions of dictionaries that have extra capabilities? So there's a precedent for the collections module having these. Interestingly, if you were to scan out in the wild, you would see variations of dictionaries, hundreds of variants of dictionaries. Should we put all of the hundreds of variations in the collections module, or should we pick and choose only a special few? Only the special few, if we put hundreds in, it actually makes the module harder to learn and use. I'd ask, how many of you read all 100? You're like, I, you lost me at number 10. So we only would have put something in if it's good. Also, a standard library is a special place. Once you put something in, it's very difficult to take it out. So it had better be good. Now, in order to increase the stakes for my students, at the time that I was having them do the design review, the decision of whether Transform Dict uh, had, whether it should go in, that decision hadn't been made yet. And that decision, I told them, is quite important. I said, you all get to vote, and your votes count on whether uh, it's going to go in or not. And it is not a random, I like it or don't like it. You have to take responsibility for your decision. If you say yes, and it goes in, we can never take it out. And if it's a bad idea that causes people to make bad code, it will be in there for generations, and your great-great-grandchildren might suffer because you put a terrible container inside uh, Python. On the other hand, this thing had made it to a PEP stage, and a PEP is kind of interesting. A PEP has a certain act of finality about it. It means we're making the big decision, collecting together all the thoughts, and making an up or down vote. If you say no to a pep, it is like taking a vampire and putting a stake through its heart. It is dead, dead, dead forever, and all variations of the idea will vanish from the earth, and no one will ever talk about it again, except if uh, Bay Piggies may meet up in uh, 2017. Okay, <laughs> so it's a decision of consequence. If you say no, this idea and all variations of it are dead forever and will never make it to the standard library, and no one will ever decide to work on it again because we said it was terrible. But if you say it's good, people who have to live are going to have to live with it a long time. Is it kind of a big deal whether you say yes or no? All right, and so we'll see what uh, you think. So far, is it looking pretty good for uh, the transform dick? It is. So I challenge my children to say this is a decision of consequence, and my uh, learners are the typical people who we would want to be using this. So uh, there will be a test coming up uh, shortly for several of you who are volunteers and for some of the rest. So let me go introduce the transform dick. By the way, is this talk about the transform dick? No, it is a talk about the talk about the process of evaluating it. I hope you learned something deep here, which is you can teach people to program, but the judgment of what they should be programming and what they should do seems to be something that is not commonly taught. I'd like to do that now. So we've had dozens of variants of it, uh, of uh, uh, dicts in use. Let's uh, let the transform dict introduce itself. So I'd like to show you its doc string. 
when, and it says it is a dictionary that calls a transformation function when looking up keys, but preserves the original keys. For example, and this was in the doc string, you make a transform dict whose transformation function is to lowercase a, uh, a string. So when I uh, store foo with a capital F and set it equal to five, later I can look it up with lowercase, all upper, and mixed case, and all of those are equal to five, and this returns true. And after these lookups, the set of all keys is just the original key foo. Fair enough? And that is the transform dict introducing itself. Why am I having it introduce itself rather than me telling you what it does? Who knows? Because when users first see transform dict and want to know what it does, they're going to type help. This is what it's going to see. And so at this point, 100% of your understanding of the transform dict is what it told you about itself. All right. Was I pretty clear on, on that and you guys got all of that and I, I didn't mumble or anything? All right. It's called a transform dict. What does it change a dictionary into? What does it change a dictionary into? <laughs> that was a correct answer. Interestingly, amongst uh, uh, my test groups, Right after having seen this doc string walk through it step by step, a lot of people said it transforms a dict into something else using a function. So the name already, are you concerned about the name? The word transformation can be used in a lot of ways. It transforms a dict. Might be a reasonable guess of what it does. It's not what it actually does. That said, there are lots of things in the Python world where you kind of have to know what it does to know what the name means, like set, default, and dictionaries. Nobody intrinsically knows what that means. They have to be uh, 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 taught. All right, so when I store a key into uh, uh, the dictionary and then go look it up, when does the transformation happen? Does the transformation happen when I store it or when I look it up? Anna, what do you think? What's that? When you look it up. Okay, Jeff, uh, when I uh, put a key in the dictionary and then go look it up later, when does the transformation happen? When I put it in or look it up? Okay, Catherine, what do you think? When you look it up. All right, and Daniel. You're inclined to say that when you look it up, it is called. But you're also concerned about performance as well. You should be. Uh, yes, sir. It depends on what? Oh, on how it's implemented. But you're not supposed to have to look at the implementation. You're supposed to be able to look at the doc string and it's supposed to tell you. Inform the doc string actually told you and not a single person in the room, as near as I can tell, got it. The answer is the way that the transform dict works is when you put it in, it lowercases the key when you put it in. That's necessary so that you can find it later. So this gets lowercase to lowercase foo on the way in. Then when you look it up later with all uppercase, it lowercases it again so the two match. So the transformation happens on both sides. We had a 100% failure rate. Is that because I've got the dumbest panel members ever? <laughs> or does it suggest to you that my smart panel of astute Python users who are volunteering their personal time to go to a meetup, that those people who are amongst our best users aren't understanding exactly what this does, and that it's the transform dict that did a bad job of communicating what it does. So possibly this could be solved. By the way, uh, the doc string itself gave the same answer that you did, <laughs> which is it says it calls a transformation function when looking up keys. But it can't work that way because then it wouldn't be able to look them up to begin with. And so the doc string itself was extremely poorly written. Did we learn something new? Does that mean the transform dict is bad or that the doc string just needs improving? Doc string needs improving. Why the heck would a senior Python developer it's been working for years in the Python community. Right, a doc string this bad and this uh, misleading. That's exactly it. Correct answer, five bucks. Because if you've lived this thing, 
if you implemented it, if you knew what you wanted it to do, if you knew how it worked from the, if it's obvious to you how it works, the dot string is an afterthought. Bed of cutters, that's how it works. Forget what I said, it just, it, it transforms. I called it a transform. How could you not know? <laughs> what happened to that developer can happen to you. You get involved, wrapped up in your tool, you can't imagine that people would use it in any other way. Fair enough? So is it important to contact users so that we can learn something? So at this point, we have learned shallow flaws. One shallow flaw is the name of it is a transform dict. Another uh, uh, shallow flaw uh, of it is that its uh, doc string is not particularly uh, good. That said, this example should have communicated uh, uh, quite a bit. Now, I've got a question for you. In this example, start to finish, how many times was casefold called? After all, Daniel was concerned about performance. So just study this code, it's only three calls. Tell me how many times casefold was called. You can hold up your fingers. It's four, two, three, five, three, Oh, so this one had to call it once on the way in. This had to call it on the lookup. This had to call it on the lookup. This had to call it on the lookup. But then when we list the keys, it runs the transformation again. Who learned something new? So are there some unobvious uh, uh, performance characteristics of uh, uh, this tool? Now, let's do a dir of it. That's your second way to learn about how an object works. When you're exploring new classes, you just do a dir to see uh, what is there. This thing is called a transform dict, and it's a kind of dictionary. Is, are there any methods here that surprise you at all? Is there anything different from a regular dictionary? Transform fun. Does it surprise you terribly that if you create a transformation dictionary and pass in a transform func that you can see an attribute for it later and look up what that function is? No, and it's no different than uh, in a default dict, you can look up the factory function. Fair enough? So that is unsurprising. Other than the person who just spoke, is there anybody else who sees something weird? Remember the rule from the Lego movie, if you see anything weird, report it immediately. <laughs> I love that movie, by the way. Okay, yes, sir? Get item. Why didn't the rest of you see that? What's wrong with it? Have you never used Python dictionaries before? Have you used Python dictionaries before? You have. Do Python dictionaries have a get item method? You can't remember. Have you used Python dictionaries before? Do Python dictionaries have a get item method? Hey, what dunder method is associated with the square brackets? Oh, no, what, what method is associated with the square brackets? That, not, and there's a get item here. So it's not dunder. That's it. So a problem with this is it's an optical illusion. It turned out amongst my learners who had been working with dictionaries all week long uh, during their uh, uh, training and had seen the Durs of Dick, this is invisible to them because in regular dictionaries, this is called dunder get item. Yes, sir. Are you trying to say that uh, if you train the transform func later that you were A, expecting the transform dict won't work, or B, expecting uh, that it will reapply the transformation function so that you can use a new one? Seems like a pitfall. Fortunately, this uh, code was designed by an expert Python designer and thought of it. And this thing, unlike most classes in Python, is uh, uh, not exposing the attribute directly, but by way of a read-only property, and so it turns out you can't write to this. Your pitfall was cleverly anticipated by a Python core developer. <laughs> <laughs> the time machine strikes again. You guys know the legend of the time machine? How many of you don't know about the time machine? 
Oh, okay. So it's a, a, a famous thing in the Python community. So in the Python uh, a dev list, it's a place where all the Python core developers chat with each other about features and what's not, but anybody can join it and anyone can post to it and occasionally and anyone does, an angry anyone. And they come in and they demand something. This Python is terrible. If you all knew what you were doing, you wouldn't just be so angry centric. You would have put Unicode uh, support into the language. You all are so Anglo-centric. You're terrible people. You should really put that in in the next one. By the way, did I mention you're terrible people? <laughs> and then Quido would traditionally come back and respond, I agree with you. I actually feel so terrible about having not done this. Apparently, I was very Anglo-centric and didn't consider the needs of the rest of the world. Oh, wait, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, and so, and not an American. He says, you know what? I'm going to get out the keys to my time machine, go back in time, and fulfill your request and put it in, let's say as early as Python 1.6, I'll add Unicode support. There, I went back in time and did it. Go check your uh, Python now. It's already there. The legend of the time machine is often by the time users anticipate, I need something, we've already put it there somewhere. And so that's the story of the time machine. All right. So. You all have identified a shallow defect here. The shallow defect is get item was a terrible name uh, for this because it looks so much like a dunder method that a person looking at this dir couldn't see it. Are you guys getting the sense of how these uh, uh, design reviews are supposed to work? Okay, and uh, I don't know if you've been, been to any of these uh, classes where, uh, you know, on the more HR side where they have you write out your thoughts on a subject and you put them up on a board and you put post-it notes everywhere. This is essentially what I did with the transform dict. Uh, it's actually a great process and people collected their thoughts and wrote them down, put them on post-it note and we tagged different parts of this. And this is a great way to do a focus group study on a tool and programmers are our users of the standard library. So this is a uh, terrible name only in that it's unfindable. Now get item, what do you think get item returns? It looks up a key and gives you a, well, we already have a dunder get item method that does that. So why do we need a non dunder get item method? We've, this, these square brackets up here already called dunder get item. What does this one do? Your hypothesis was incorrect. What's that? It skips the transform. That would actually be a great suggestion and something that it should do, but doesn't do. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you have been to my talks before, but I like to award money. It's just not real. 25 bucks for that. <laughs> I have presented this to hundreds of great engineers and not a single person saw that. You were the first. And in fact, that is a defect that we have no way to bypass the uh, transform of a function. But that is not, in fact, what this does. What does it do? It goes back and gets the original key that was put in. It finds the foo with a capital F. Okay, so maybe a better name for this would be get original key. How do you like that? <laughs> okay, so, so far we're identifying shallow problems. None of these things affect the acceptance or rejectance of the transform dict. But already we know something. We know that out of all the people who said, yippee, I love this, and there were over 100 of them on the Python core developers uh, uh, list, and over 100 of them on the Python ideas list who said, yippee, this is great, we need this. Does that tell you that a single one of them had used it? Had a single one of them put it in front of another human being, said, here, go use this thing and solve a problem with it. They just said, hey, from a distance, it looks great. You'll make great investors someday. For a demo distance, it looks great. Yeah. I'll tell you some investment stories at some point. <laughs> yeah, I invested in Lucid. From a distance, it looked great. <laughs> it's former AT&T Bell Labs, smartest people. What could possibly go wrong? Those engineers had left and it got managed to death. I watched my stock go from 20 to 18, 16, and like, how bad can it go? When it hit two, I realized it could go all the way to zero. <laughs> so it looks good from a distance. Is that a great criteria for putting something in a standard library? You don't think so. All right, so its other capability is the get item foo returns the original, okay? 
Now, I've got a question for you. What does uh, item mean in Python? Item. Yeah. What is an item? an item? We occasionally use the word item in Python in a fairly specific way. Anna, what does item mean to you? If I tell you there's an item in Python. Oh, Anna is thinking uh, with her linguistic hat. She's uh, as with her, you are a linguistics expert, are you not? And so she processed every language she knows, which is a lot, and she said, item is the most vague term in the world. Anything can be an item. <laughs> Raymond starts dating Heidi Klum, suddenly they're an item, okay? <laughs> But that's because amongst all of your languages, you don't know Dutch. In Dutch, item has a precise meaning, a tuple of length to a key value pair. <laughs> I made that up. Okay, so uh, dictionary, dot items. So, get item. We also have another get item in Python, which is dunder get item. You look up a key and gives you a value. So, when I call get uh, this get item function, what is it going to return? Is it going to return, like Dunder get item, a value? Is it going to return a key? Or is it going to return a key value pair or something else? How many of you say that when I call get item, it's going to return a value? How many of you think it's going to return a key? How many of you think it's going to return a transformed key? How many of you think it's going to return a pair? How many of you think the pair is, uh, the first element of the pair is going to be a key? How many of you think the first element of the pair is going to be a transformed key? How many of you think it's going to be an untransformed key? <laughs> that accounted for more than the entire room. Okay, keep in mind, I showed you the answer and told you what it was going to do, but it turns out it returns the initial key and the currently stored uh, uh, value. Fair enough, which is interesting because that's not what item means elsewhere in Python. This can be solved by better naming, okay? So now, that's the shallow level of understanding. That's what a user would get from a doc string and a quick explanation and running some quick uh, uh, explorations. But let's talk about the internal design. What does it have? It is uh, a single dictionary-like tool. The purpose of making a dict-like tool is you want something with a dict API. What does it combine into it? A transformation function like casefold. Also, it has two dictionaries, which often surprises most people. Usually during my design reviews, I let them work with it for a while and then they had them make predictions. How many dictionaries did it have inside? An occasional person would be able to predict it. We don't document that it has uh, two dictionaries because that's an internal implementation detail. On the other hand, if you have any idea what it does, you will realize it can't function without two dictionaries. So one of them takes the transform key, which looks up to, uh, the value. The other one looks up the original untransformed uh, uh, key. So if you think there's only one dictionary, does this occupy twice as much space as you expect? So an issue would be, users are going to use this expecting that it has half of the weight of the memory that it actually does. Okay, so if they can't anticipate the uh, implementation, they're not going to know that it's a fairly heavy container. That said, that is not a disaster. There's a number of things in Python to where people don't know the internals and it is mostly good enough and they're not able to guess how it works. <laughs> and yet they're able to use it. Most people can use the LRU cache perfectly the first time, every time, and have no idea how to implement an LRU cache. How many of you like the LRU cache? Ah, oh, man, Quido's default dict is still winning. My LRU cache, which is one of my secret favorite things in the Python uh, uh, library, uh, go look at the LRU cache. It will improve your life. Probably hidden in the Funk Tools module. All right, so that's the internal design. So here were some uh, API design decisions made by the person who made it. The transformation function is stored in a read on the attribute. That addressed your concern that you had over there. The two internal dicts are not exposed. This is important because if we expose them, a person can change one dict, not the other, and get the two out of sync with each other. Does it make sense that they're encapsulated? Catherine, do you agree? Excellent uh, uh, choice. Uh, the combined uh, dict is modeled to the untransformed key to the value. Items, on the other hand, returns pairs, 
And in the pairs, it's the untransformed key rather than a transform. There were two ways to do it. We could have done transform. And also, the get item method, which is the new method, returns the untransformed uh, uh, our original untransformed key. Who thinks it's kind of weird that you can go from the untransformed to the original untransformed? I didn't inspect that. And the missing method was not supported. Uh, there's a number of reasons why it's not supported. It was awkward to put in there. Do most dictionary-like objects support dunder missing? Now, how many of you even knew that dunder missing uh, existed? Dunder missing is a fantastic method. You should go learn what it does. It's incredibly powerful, very easy to use, and it could become your new best friend. It's a wonderful tool. And where is it? It's missing, hence the name. <laughs> okay, so dunder missing is uh, not supported. All right, so I've told you all the internal design. It takes a transformation function. It has one dictionary that goes from the transform key to the value, which kind of makes sense, the lowercase key to find the value. And it has a second dictionary to get you back to the end uh, transform key. I've mentioned that we can't see both dictionaries. I've mentioned that the, uh, uh, that the combined dict is modeled with untransformed to value. I've told you what items returns, tuples of length to the untransformed to the current value. I've uh, showed you and talked about several times and said again what the get item method returns, a tuple of length to including the untransformed key, and I told you that uh, dunder missing was not uh, supported. So what I would do in my class is give people the shallow understanding that they would get by reading what's new, the help, and experimenting with it for just a, a few minutes. Then I augmented their understanding by telling them how it was designed. Further, I told them all of the design's decisions. Does this put them ahead of most users? If you know how a tool was documented, you've experimented with it, you know the internal design and all the external design decisions, that should put you very far ahead of the game. Jeff, do you agree? Really? <laughs> Jeff? I'm going to ask my panel some questions, and there are no wrong answers. It is not you who are being judged. What's being judged? The transform dict. If the transform dict manages to defeat you, that means there's something wrong with A, U, or B, the transform dict. <laughs> B. Anna, are there any wrong answers to the questions? No. Daniel, is there anything? Uh, uh, that you can get wrong. No, these are my expert uh, Python users. Also, who was my uh, person who uh, the over here correctly predicted what get item does? Sir, you are a proud new volunteer for the uh, 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 panel. <laughs> Keep in mind, he is one of my sharpest users here. He made a successful prediction. Also, you had heard of the transform dict before the class, right? Oh, okay. Who had heard of uh, transform dict before uh, today? Another volunteer. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. I redefined the word volunteer. All right. So uh, I'll go make a transform dict, which uh, does a case fold. Now, this isn't just any case fold. This case fold wraps stirred up case fold, and it counts the number of calls to case fold because we want to know the performance of it. And show will show me what the count is. And so I've got a global variable and I can reset the count somewhat easily. So we'll start with a reset and a show, which tells you there are currently zero calls to the case fold. All right. So I go to store all uppercase Raymond equal red. All right. My panelists, how many calls have been made to case fold? It's exactly one. Everyone who said two misprotected because you remember that there's two dictionaries, but now you know something. Apparently, to populate the two, it doesn't have to. Uh, do. Most users will never do this. They'll never know what the performance is or how many times the function gets called. Mainly, they'll complain about it later if the function call is expensive. I'm being charged by the function call. Does that ever happen? It will by the end of our uh, examples. I'm going to show you an actual user example where they were being charged by the function call, okay? By the transformation function. 
All right, the next one is I go to put in the sweet and lovely Rachel Hedinger, who is blue. All right, and I'll put in Rachel again in title case. Now, to be fair, Rachel isn't really blue. She's a Windows programmer. Windows programmers are never blue. They're Azure. <laughs> All right. Jeff, I go to look up all, uppercase, Rachel. Make a prediction. Will she be found, yes or no? Yes. You say uh, yes. What is her color? Azure. You're going to say Azure. That is exactly a, a correct uh, a prediction. Okay. And uh, Catherine? How many calls do you think we've made cumulatively to uh, Casefold? Uh, but we also, uh, it's in fact three plus the one that we already had. And so in fact, my panelists are dead on. So it means that the Casefold, uh, the transform, by the way, it's not you as being judged here, it's the transform dick. The fact that you predicted uh, correctly indicates that the world is uh, good for the transform dick. Now, how do you look at the key value pairs for a dictionary? Items. items, okay. Because in Dutch, item means tuple of length two, key value pair. <laughs> okay, now uh, the key. What is it going to show for Rachel? I'm going to give you several choices. There is the four uppercase letters, the one uppercase letter, the six uppercase letters are no uppercase letters. Your choice is zero uppercase letters, six uppercase letters, one uppercase letter, or uh, four. I'd like everybody to vote with your fingers. When I do items, which Rachel is going to show? With one vowel? Okay. So I get four, 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 one, 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 four, 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 one. No threes. <laughs> And no sixes. Okay. And in fact, you all were correct. It saved the original version, not this one, which is kind of interesting because Azure, is that associated with the title case, Rachel, or the all up, uh, mixed case? So now the, the original key is no longer associated with its current value. How many of you think that's kind of weird? That might be a surprising uh, behavior. Interestingly, to the extent that there have been case, uh, instead of case preserving dictionaries before, the one in the request module would give you the latest key that was stored and not the uh, earliest. And the transform dict gives you no ability to change that choice. Does it mean that it has some limits in terms of its applicability to a broad class of problems? It means that the transform dict can't be dropped into the request module. Even if we made it, they couldn't replace their existing use case. That's a kind of a bad sign. This is a hardwired behavior and there's no easy way to change it. Uh, interestingly, Nick Coughlin, uh, who uh, is a Python core developer who looked at this, his expectation is, he said, I want to be able to get to all of these keys, the uh, variants that were saying, so I'd want to store them as a set. Another person wanted all of the original keys as a list. Some people want the latest version and it turns out most people don't want the original uh, untransformed value at all. They said, my whole purpose of transforming it was to put it into a standard form, and this is not the standard form. Okay, now make a prediction. How many calls have I made? Five. Hold up your fingers. What is this going to show? Six calls. Are you telling me just looking at the items calls the transform function? Are you saying the act of looking at the dictionary triggers a transformation function, even though it's already transformed all of the keys? Who's a little worried about that? Okay. And, and so I could kind of go on with uh, this. Now I'm gonna make another transform dig. Keep in mind, this is the specific use case that was being generalized from, so it ought to be good at that. But the whole purpose of generalizing it is so that we could use it for other things. So now, I want to take the string 12 and call int on it. What happens when you call int on a string? What does it change this into? 
an integer, and I'll go store, the, store this as 12. Oh, I should probably do a reset first uh, one. So we could get our calls and say E12 equal 12. By the way, I don't use Emac, uh, uh, idle for my personal development. I use Emacs, uh, but when on stage, always use idle because it has really some fantastic capabilities in terms of communicating very well with uh, an audience. Uh, the code colorization, the screen, clean screen layout and everything is an excellent uh, style for uh, uh, teaching. Okay, and then I put in 13. It's 13. Easy enough, let me raise this so it's a little easier for people to see. Hold on. All right. So if I look up the integer 12, what happens when you take the int of an int? So what is this going to return? 12 spelled out. Isn't that kind of a cool use of a transform dict? This was tantalizingly interesting. It suggests that there's an incredibly wide variety of uh, uh, use cases. And for uh, 13, that works. What about this one? Make a prediction. Oh, all right. Now go look up some bytes. How many of you think that one's going to succeed? Oh, that's nice. I go to look up the number eight. If a key is missing from a dictionary, what kind of error do you expect? <laughs> really? Are you telling me that when you do a dictionary lookup, you expect one of that two outcomes, either a successful lookup or a key error? Is that a reasonable expectation for a user of a dictionary? Yeah, so if a person wanted to reliably do these, they should put it in a try except. Do you agree? And what exception should they catch? And so if they catch the key error, they won't have any other problems, right? <laughs> After all, the only exceptions you can get are a key error or a successful lookup. Unless I go to look up hello. What is the int of hello? <laughs> Value error. What happened here? This key is missing, but you didn't get a key error. Is it fair to say that when we wrapped a transformation function that any errors in that transformation function percolate up and in an unexpected context will arise? I did a dictionary lookup and got a value error. You ordinarily never get a value error. You can get a type error for something unhashable. So is that going to make it hard to do reviews of code that looks like this? In fact, uh, uh, that's the case. So how many of you think that is a design flaw? So I take uh, groups of people through like, uh, an exercise like this. My goal is not to teach you the transform deck. My goal is to say, how did I evaluate this? Thing? Here's what it does, here's ways to use it, make a prediction, what's going to happen? What is a reasonable uh, try except to put around? What's it going to do here? What's its performance, et cetera? And when I run through, I can uh, mm -hmm. in the end do a show. Something very uncool is happening. <laughs> and there's more calls than a person uh, uh, might expect. Ground control to Major Tom. <laughs> All right. Mute. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to make it worse. How many of you find it tolerable? Who doesn't? It went away. <laughs> Either someone fixed it or it just randomly went away. How many of you like bugs that randomly go away? <laughs> the problem with them is they randomly come back when you least expect them. All right. So this is part of the design review process. So the, uh, uh, they haven't ripped me off the stage yet, so I'm gonna keep on talking uh, uh, for a little bit. I've got a lot more to share with you. Uh, what I'd like to do is say, outside of this process and collecting the user feedback, 
I want to give you some modalities of thinking. We are not the only ones who have to decide whether something is a good idea or not. Do you think other fields have had this problem before and they have to think of it? So one of these fields is aviation. Aviation safety is very, very important. So do you think a lot of effort has gone into making planes and aircraft uh, safe? In fact, it has. How many of you knew I was a pilot? How many of you knew that I'm rated as a ground instructor? Because I'm rated as a ground instructor, I can teach you to fly a helicopter, which is pretty cool given that I've never flown a helicopter before. <laughs> In order to get a ground instructor rating, they test you on hot air balloons, they test you on helicopters, you have to study all this stuff and you can teach it, uh, but I actually flew Frick's wing and uh, uh, gliders. I find it interesting that you're allowed to teach things that you haven't actually done. But for grounds, uh, I wasn't an air instructor, I actually can't get you in the aircraft, but I can tell you uh, how they work. So uh, there's some interesting things. You know, you go to a car in the UK, the steering wheel is on uh, the other side and people drive on a different side of the road. Do you think that might be dangerous for an American like myself set in their ways? Yes. So in planes, we don't do that. All over the world, the pilot sits in the left seat. All over the uh, world, we have a mixture control that is our red. Our, and then we have a black control uh, for uh, uh, And so there's particular colors for these things. The instruments are arranged in a standard pattern. I always know to look, where to look, even on a 747, or on a uh, F-16, I know exactly where to look for the altimeter. Do you think it's kind of helpful that it's in uh, the right place? It might save your life someday. So do you think we might have something to learn from the field of aviation? All right, how about uh, uh, drugs? How many of you were for the legalization of, okay, I won't go there. <laughs> All right, so not those kind of uh, drugs, but medical drugs. If you approve a, a, a drug and it's bad, do you think there can be negative consequences? So my mother's no longer with us, but she, uh, a, every, everyone uh, who talks to me about her, one impression that she uh, most made on them was when I was born, I just said, and your mother counted your little fingers and your little toes, and you had 10 fingers and 10 toes. <laughs> Fingers. My mother counted my little fingers and my little toes, and it was so transformative for her. <laughs> Do most children have 10 fingers and 10 toes? Yeah. Not then. Not then. I was born in 1964, and the year before, I forgot what the drug was, but they, uh, 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 it was widely distributed. And it caused a lot of birth defects before they figured out what was happening. A bunch of kids were being uh, uh, born uh, with their uh, digits messed up in uh, some way. And so she was quite uh, uh, relieved because she had been one of the people to have taken this drug. It was a fairly big deal. And so it was an absolute disaster. Do you think we learned from that and have improved the process somewhat? On the other hand, you have a problem with uh, risk of incorrect uh, 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 a rejection of uh, good drugs. There are some excellent drugs that took a long time to get to market. Even now, there are some drugs that are, they're not quite willing to approve, but we know can improve some people's lives and some people who really need it and won't still be with us if they wait any longer. So at the FDA, do you think there is a, a, a strong push and pull on both sides? If you make a mistake, a lot of people could suffer for it. On the other hand, if you don't approve it, a lot of people could suffer. It's a no-win situation, or in Star Trek terms, the Kobayashi Maru scenario. Do you think we have anything to learn from that? Okay. And what about the law? The law has things to teach us as well. So a particular part of the law that I like is UCC, the Uniform Commerce Code. I'm a certified public accountant, so I had to study a lot of uh, uh, UCC. And it turns out, a long time ago, we worked out what was necessary to create a fair uh, system of trade. So. I want to go tell, uh, sell you something, and I know that it's what I'm telling you it is, but I also know it's not what you really want. Do you think that is good for trade and good for business? I have something, I tell him what it is, I don't lie to him about it, but I happen to know that what he intends to use it for, it's not going to help him. It turns out UCC prohibits that. There's an implied warranty for uh, uh, merchantability and for uh, fitness for a particular purpose. And so I'm not supposed to sell you the wrong tool for a job, even though you know what the tool is and I haven't lied to you about it. These things are necessary for free and fair trade. 
you think that we can learn something from the law. All right, so let's go to uh, do these. And I, uh, I hope you enjoy these ideas. They are from other fields and it teaches us about our own field. So the concept of orthogonality is something that we can learn from aviation. Orthogonality has to do with the loose coupling of uh, uh, parts. The idea is you can change one thing without changing uh, uh, something else. So if you combine a hammer with a nail remover, that is a perfectly reasonable thing. On one side of the hammer, you can pull a nail out. On the other one, you can put the nail in. Those two things are orthogonal to each other, but they belong in the same tool. But if you combine a hammer and a saw together, people need saws and they need hammers, is it a bad idea to smush the two together? In fact, that's the case. So Andy Hunt, very uh, famous programmer, you should read it. What's that? In fact, there is a use case. <laughs> I agree, and no one has ever brought that up before. 10 bucks. <laughs> there is a use case for having a saw together with a uh, hammer, or actually a pick, which is quite useful for things like picking apart ice and when you're falling off the side of a glacier <laughs> and it stops you from falling, you get one shot at it and either it works or it doesn't. If it doesn't work, no one ever goes back to complain and return the merchandise. <laughs> All right, so a car example is we have orthogonal controls. There is a pedal for stopping. There is a pedal, uh, there is uh, a button for starting and there is a wheel for turning. And you can operate these things independently. They're said to be orthogonal, so it's not that difficult to learn to drive a car. What about a helicopter? A helicopter is a disaster. A helicopter has a cyclic. You hold it in the right hand, and when you uh, turn uh, uh, the cyclic, it, you lean it to the left, the air aircraft leans uh, to the left. As you might expect, you can tilt it forward and backward. You can also have uh, your left hand on the collective, and when you turn it, it's like a throttle, and uh, it increases power to your blades and changes the uh, pitch, which generates more lift. It's the go up and down control. And then you've got the uh, 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 throttle. So you've then got the two foot pedals and the foot pedals control the tail rotor. If you push on the left pedal, it spins around one side. You push around on the other. It just turns on the fan and spins you around. Easy enough? <laughs> <laughs> the most basic thing in flying a helicopter, hover. Nobody makes their first jump. Tank load the jump program. No one ever can hover their first time. I've never heard of it. But let's take a simple thing. The instructor starts it in a hover and then says go forward. You get this bright idea. You take uh, the cyclic and stay, uh, push it forward. And in fact, it leans the aircraft uh, uh, forward as you expect. However, some of your thrust is no longer going downward. It's going uh, backward, which means you start to fall out of the sky. You reach over and uh, you add some power, changing the pitch of the uh, blades, starting to take you back up. However, the blades are spinning in a particular direction, and when you add more power to it, you start to rotate in the opposite direction. So you need to step on the uh, 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 pedal to blow the fan back around the other way. In order to just take you out of a hover to going forward, you have to operate all three controls simultaneously, and most people cannot do it within the first few uh, tries is simply take over the uh, control. They, uh, they typically let you turn it fairly far sideways before they take the controls back. And, they, <laughs> and the first time they give you the control, they do it fairly high up in the air. It's a very long time before a few feet off the ground, they say things like land. Landing, do you think that's kind of a useful skill? It's the last thing you learn. <laughs> because you're a little close to the ground, and when you're close to the ground, if you tilt the blades, what bad thing happens? Ah, you see how it is. And so we wait till you're really good at controlling the uh, uh, helicopter before we let you land. So you just say, I've been taking helicopter lessons for two months. Can you land? You <laughs> haven't taught me that yet. All right, so let's evaluate the transform dict on uh, orthogonality. All right, so it has a transform function. It has a first dictionary and it has a second dictionary. People don't always need the second dictionary. They don't always want to go back to the original uh, key. You can't get to the original key without going through uh, this dictionary, and there is no way to get to the transform value. Notice on the right side, no transform value. Are these controls orthogonal? 
How many of you say yes or no? How many of you say yes? How many of you say no, they're not orthogonal? Okay. And I'm split in between. I would say you haven't been given all of the controls because there's no way to get to the uh, transformed key. And you can't uh, alter the transform function from instance we mentioned before, and you can't access either of these two dictionaries directly. So there's a lot of safeties on it. But the safeties mean you don't get full control of the device, so you are not pilot in command when you're flying uh, this device. So this one, I rate a 50-50 in the category of orthogonality. We have taken two things together, a dictionary and a transformation function, and the question is, should they be smushed together or not? Is it easier to have a transform function and a dictionary, or is it easier to have a transforming function dictionary? And so I'd say it's actually toward the bottom side, and most of you seem to agree, that you're actually better off with two separate pieces, the hammer and saw, than a hammer saw, unless you're on the side of a, a high school. So implied warranties. This is from uh, UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. So uh, there's two uh, applied warranties. One of them is uh, applied warranty of merchantability. The important part here is in bold. The goods must reasonably conform to an ordinary buyer's expectations, that it is what it says it is. So the uh, traditional example in law is a uh, uh, fruit that looks good and smells good, but is known to be contaminated in some way or has a worm in it or something like that. It's not uh, really merchantable because it doesn't conform to a buyer's expectation. A buyer expects that if they buy an apple that looks good and smells good, that it's okay to eat. Isn't that a reasonable expectation? So the law places a burden on the person selling it to make sure that it's suitable for its particular uh, uh, purpose. Uh, and would meet a buyer's expectations. By the way, are we selling anything when we put things in standard library? Yes, when people use it, are they buying something for us? And they're paying for it with their time, and as they study it, and as they start to build code around it, they are paying something for us. It costs them something to use our tool, and they expect to come out net ahead. It is my belief that the transform dick fails in this regard, because the transformation function can potentially be very expensive. Uh, an example I might not have time to get to, so I'll just mention it now, is uh, one that a learner had and tried to use it for, and that was taking postal addresses as a person types it in, going out to the post office and cleaning up that address and putting it in a canonical form. You have to clean up the addresses before you send out a mass uh, a mail and put it as, so if a person spells out California, it needs to be CA. There needs to be a comma after the uh, uh, city name. There's an exact placement of the zip code and it should be a zip plus four. Apartment should be spelled APT exactly and nothing, uh, nothing else. So this uh, is, uh, and if you do that, you get a discount on sending your uh, email. But the services that do this for you charge you for cleaning up the address. So for every thousand addresses, you owe them $10 or something like that. And so, this is an expensive computation, one, because you have to pay for it, and number two, because you, uh, it takes time going out on the internet, doing a TCP connection, three-way handshake, send out the request, and using the REST API. So it is not a cheap function, and so I saw somebody use that in a transform day. Here's the interesting thing. You've paid cash money and your time to go clean up an address. And now you look up a, a, a malformed address in the dictionary, and it gives you the correct value. Does that seem reasonable? Here's the problem. I had mentioned before, there is no way of getting the transform value out, back out. So the thing that you paid for, the cleaned up address is in there and there's no API for getting it back out. How many of you consider that to be a defect? The apple looked good, it smelled good, but it was bad for you, it was contaminated. There's also a warranty for a particular purpose. And so the, there's a, here's the full definition of it, but the important part I bolded here. The goods should reflect a specific request. What should it do? So in our case, the specific request was, we want a case-preserving, case-folding uh, uh, a dictionary that could be substituted in existing tools that already had them. And it turned out it didn't fit because all of the existing tools stored the last save key and not the first on a, original of a key. So, at that point, is it fit for what it was designed for? If we put this in the standard library, not a single place where people were using case sensitive and preserving dictionary would they be able to use this, okay? And so here's the classic example. 
you need a light uh, pickup truck for to handle small loads, but somebody sells you a heavy dump truck that is uh, too heavy duty for such task. They've sold you something that works, but they've sold you the wrong tool. The transform dick has a second issue. It turns out almost every use case, except for that original use case, people don't want the original untransformed values. For example, the postal uh, example. You have an uncleaned up address, you run a function and clean up the address. Do you ever want the messy one back again ever? Pretty much no. And if you did, you would at least want the entire set of all of them that were ever entered as opposed to the first time somebody put in a, a, a bad one. So this tells you that in most use cases, people are paying for two dictionaries when they only want one. And it's not just the dictionary lookup time, they're paying the space. You're actually saving the cleaned up version and the uncleaned up version, even though you ever, never need it. So do you think that this uh, uh, meets the warranty of fitness for a particular purpose? By the way, I'm, I'm not intending to bag so much on the transform dick here. I was very enthusiastic about it at the beginning. The idea of a transformation, generic transformation, was tantalizingly interesting. And I volunteered to be the person to decide on the transform dick in part because the person who made it was somebody who I had stepped on their toes once before and my approving their, uh, uh, their proposal would have been a way of making nice with them. I was really looking forward to approving this thing when I volunteered to do it. It was a politically correct move. It's like, oh, this person will like me again. <laughs> you, you can see how this uh, probably uh, uh, turned out. All right, so requirements versus realities. How many of you have heard of uh, Chris Alexander? How many of you have heard of the book Design Patterns? Oh, the inspiration for Design Patterns was a book by Chris Alexander on design patterns, but not for computer programming, but for architecture. The idea was, uh, that was the inspiration for computer design patterns is that in the world of architecture, there are standard problems and known solutions, forces pushing you for something, forces pushing you against. He's a very famous person and a deep uh, a thinker. And he taught us something interesting. And this is a, uh, I'm gonna give you all of these slides. I'll give you, I'll uh, tweet out a link for it right after this so that uh, you can read this in detail. It's worth at least reading that paragraph because he was talking about an experience as an architect. He was given some requirements to design, I think, something over a toll booth. They told him what to make. He knew what a toll booth was, and he was going to go make a diagram that made a toll booth. Did he already know what one was? He already knew what he wanted and was going to draw it and was told what he should make. Isn't it kind of nice to have a complete set of specifications and a clear idea of what you're going to do before you go do it? It is nice but he started drawing it out and realized there were some things wrong with his idea that as you start to play it out, well, that doesn't get people to the toll booth. What happens if a person doesn't have change? How do they get back out without backing up all of the uh, traffic? And what he found is that the problem itself teaches you something about the solution. And in the end, he came up with a profoundly different solution than what he was asked for or what he set out to do. And I think that this is brilliant. What do I ask of you? When you set a given some requirements and have an idea of what you want to do, open your mind and let the problem teach you what it was supposed to do. Fair enough? So the transform dict, I think, fails in this category. Here's why. The person who made it knew exactly what they wanted it to do. It needs to be a case-preserving, case-insensitive dictionary. And they made up a requirement in their mind. It must save the first key that's stored. That was not based on any users or whatnot. It's just what they thought it should do. And then the second concept was we're going to generalize it. We're going to expand beyond uh, just case uh, pres preservation and do other preservation functions. And knowing those things, you know exactly what to do. Write a case preserving dictionary, then factor out the transformation function, make it part of the API, and you're done. That was a mistake. Did we uh, uh, miss talking to users? So the mistake was we designed to this person's requirements in their head about obvious things that were obvious to a programmer. What we didn't do is find user stories and say, let's design something to fit the user stories. We just said, I know what I want to do. Has that ever happened to you? This happens to me all the time. This is a tendency that we need to uh, fight off. And so it wasn't informed by actual use. The biggest mistake wasn't the creation of the transform dictionary. The biggest mistake 
was that it was proposed to be added directly to the standard library. Instead, it should have gone out on the Python package index, let users experience it, give it feedback, if it developed a following, if it went through some iterations, if its API improved, and once it became a loved thing, then we put it in. We say the standard library is where code goes to die. Preferably, it should be dead before it gets there. It needs to be a perfect thing when it arrives because the standard library is a standard and it's not easily changed. So we want code to live free and fast and iterate in an agile manner on the Python package index. Once it's become awesome, once it's dominated its category, is the best in that category, is a good general purpose uh, solution that everybody prefers. When all the bug reports have stopped coming in, all the feature requests come in, when the documentation makes sense to everybody, that's a great day to propose it to the standard library. Very few people are allowed to buy the passes process. Those people include core developers. I have put stuff straight in the standard library. For instance, uh, 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 the uh, chain map went straight in without going through the Python package index first. Name tuple, on the other hand, had a, uh, about a year of life uh, before it was used, and I transformed it many, many times based on user feedback. And so name tuple was basically a perfect thing when it arrived. Chain map, the only thing that made me confident enough to put it in directly was I modeled it after chain map had been reinvented many different times, and I just went out and studied those implementations, found what was successful about them, pulled their common features together, and no extra ingenuity was required. So we didn't have to go through a phase of user testing because it had been user tested in other forms. Does that make sense? All right, I hope you all learned something important from that. And we're almost at the bottom of this page. Uh, I know we're getting tight on time, but you all still seem interest. Nobody is interested, nobody is snoring. And this is something uh, that I consider to be very important. A basic of problem solving is that sometimes it's easier to solve the general problem than the specific problem. Sometimes it's easier to go the other way around. So if you pick up Polya's book on problem solving, they will teach you that as problem solving strategies. But once you've got a specific solution, the act of generalizing it teaches you things. So we had a quadratic equation at one point in mathematics. People sought to go out and find another one, a cubic equation and then a quartic equation. The act of trying to generalize it led Galois to invent abstract algebra and taught us something very important. Can you learn something from generalization? Also, should your functions have hardwired behavior or should you allow users to modify that behavior? Hardwired is generally bad unless that behavior they modify is bad for them. Fair enough. So we know that we want to uh, generalize where possible. Also, do you like design to be um, APIs to be mostly consistent or inconsistent? <laughs> you like consistent? Oh, so none of you are fans of common list. <laughs> okay, scheme has a very consistent design. Common list, on the other hand, is battle hardened and reflects many, many iterations of many people solving problems in different ways. So its APIs are not particularly internally uh, uh, consistent. Uh, that makes it harder to learn, although it's a very uh, powerful uh, uh, language. So, generalization is good. On the other hand, hypergeneralization hyper is bad. That's when you go a step too far and have overgeneralized and created new problems that you didn't have before by solving the general problem. And there's an art in trying to figure out which one you have. What I'd like you to take away from this is when your time comes to make a generalization, you should always ask yourself, is it a good generalization or is it a hypergeneralization? Would you like to see a defect in the uh, standard library? All right. And so this one is what happens when I stop looking at the check-ins for a while and I'm still irritated that I went a month without looking at check-ins and I didn't have a chance to fix this one and recognize the problem early on. So we have some methods start with and ends with. We loop over these and I want to know if any of these routes ends with HTML or XML. And so the ones that match that pattern are just these. So it's used as a uh, filter. How many of you ever use starts with and ends with? Now looking at this method call, what strikes you is, let me use the technical term, icky. <laughs> the extra parentheses are icky. What would have been a better API design? 
to take the parentheses out and to put in separate arguments. Do we have the ability to put in variable length argument list in Python? Yeah, we can use star args. So an excellent design is to not require the extra layer parentheses. In fact, this is a very commonly misused tool. and People forget the extra parens. Do you agree this is icky? So why did we do it? Because we had no choice. Why did we have no choice? Because someone who came before us hypergeneralized. So we have a method, string count. We have find and index. Index, the use cases for index, as you go to look for a case uh, where something starts, do some processing on it, and then we have to provide an optional start argument. And here's why. Once you've indexed into a string, then you want to go further and find the next case. Find everywhere there's the word city. Locate the first one, do some processing on it, now locate the second one. If we didn't have start here, you wouldn't be able to find any subsequent ones. Is it fair to say that start is a key part of this API? Okay, and most things in Python that have a start have an end. This is particularly important because if you uh, uh, download something from a socket session, the first part of it is the HTTP headers, the rest of it is the body. So it's nice to chop off the body and say only search the headers. Does it make sense that you don't actually want to search all of a giant string, sometimes just the first part of it? And this is wonderful because it matches the slice notation. In other words, there's perfectly legitimate use cases for this, and Quido thought of this all the way back in 1991 and put this in. Pretty awesome. Now, we also have find. Find has the same API for exactly the same reasons, and they're all good reasons. After find came count. Count says find the number of occurrences in the city. Does it make sense that you might not want to go all the way to the end? Does it make sense that you might want to chop off the initial headers and go after that without having to make another copy of the string? These are easy to learn because it matches slices. There's legitimate use cases uh, for these, and they have a long and wonderful history. This is great design. Not kidding. I think it's awesome. Do you agree? So now a wiener comes along. Wiener not being a good term. Okay, how about goober? A goober, not a good term. Okay, an unfortunate well-meaning soul. How about that? So this well-meaning soul comes along, and then, uh, they're not great designers, but they're a person whose only skill is noticing thing A is not consistent with thing B. One of these things is not like the other. And they looked at starts with and ends with. Starts with, at that point, only took one argument, the prefix. And suffix only took, uh, ends with, only took one argument, the suffix. They looked and said, these three methods all have a start and end. These two don't. These two things are not like the others. The people who made starts with and ends with weren't smart enough to put them there. That's always a flaw when it comes to the standard library. Something hazardous is to believe that the people who came before you were stupid. And so without consulting the people who wrote it and said, why didn't you put it there? The presumption was, oh, you must have just missed it. Keep in mind, this stuff has gone through a lot of discussions on Python dev, been reviewed by multiple Python core developers, been in widespread use for a long time, and no user has ever requested this behavior. And when you think about it, the word starts with stops making sense if you do a start into a string and into the end, and ends with doesn't make sense if you slice at the end. There was never a single user request for this. The original designers of this did not put it in. Does that give you a hint that this probably should not be there? But oh no, thing A is not like thing B. Thing B is good, therefore A must have it too. Don't tell me that you haven't had these thoughts. I occasionally think them and I have to turn them off. And so some wiener, goober, I mean well-intentioned, unfortunate soul trying to improve Python submitted a patch that says, these methods are inconsistent uh, uh, with the others, and they submitted a perfect patch that copied the code here exactly so their patch was correct, and they put in test cases and documentation. We had a patch with test documentation that was perfect, ran the first time, didn't leak, it was this person's first contribution, 
and we want first contributors to be rewarded and feel like that they're uh, uh, participating. And uh, they put this patch up and they had a reason for it. And the reason was it was good here, therefore it was good here, which on the surface of it sounds like a reasonable thing. You did it once, you did it a second time, a third time, you liked it all three times. Oh, surely you'll like it a fourth time. Anna, would you like it a fourth <laughs> Anna would not like it a fourth time. <laughs> and I was on vacation, and this <laughs> went in. <laughs> that wasn't actually a joke. I was on vacation and didn't see it. Because I didn't see it, it got released, which means we can't take it back. Now, it goes out, and I'm just like, at that point, I look at it and say, why is this here? And there was no good reason other than thing A is not like uh, uh, thing B. But it's released in the wild and it's very difficult to revoke these decisions. The moment we put it out, somebody in the world will rely on it. Typically, Quido will use it in one place, then you can definitely never take it back. And so it's out there. But at least I looked at it and said, this is basically harmless. You know, so we have some optional arguments that no one ever uses. And so part of the justification for going in is, is what's the worst that could possibly happen? I mean, the code works. There's no downside to it. So sometimes part of the decision is, is there a downside? Yeah, the upside might not be that great, but user wanted it. We've got test. It makes it consistent. Eh, why not? And who hasn't made a decision like that? So we didn't pay a cost for this when it went in. We paid the cost when somebody made a correct and great request at one point, I need to be able to check multiple suffixes at the same time, or multiple prefixes. I need to know if it starts with HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, et cetera. That's a legitimate and common use case. So the real use case came along. Guess what's in the way now and why we can't use variable length argument list? And that's why you have to suffer for all eternity with double parentheses here. <laughs> now, the question is, are you going to torture future generations by hypergeneralizing? Okay, I hope I taught you something important here. This is an easy trap to fall into. The people who made this uh, change actually were not idiots. They were well-meaning, they were trying to make things consistent, but they didn't really think. Not a single user has ever requested this, ever. How would it actually be used? Can we think of a legitimate use case? Is it going to preclude other use cases? Those thoughts weren't had. All it was was thing A is not like thing B, and they rushed to making a patch. And it went in the standard library, and it will never be gone, ever. Which raises the question, the transformation dictionary. The transform dict takes something that we know is useful, a case-insensitive, case-preserving dict. We know that people have wanted that more than once. It generalizes it by saying, let's take the transformation function out and let a user pass in any transformation function they want. I won't answer this question. I'll just leave it for you because we don't actually know the answers to these questions. So I just want you to think the thought. Is generalizing a case-insensitive, case-preserving dictionary a generalization that makes the world better or is it a hyper-generalization that is going to cause us to suffer for all eternity? I don't think the answer is obvious, but what I'd like you to do after this is when you design, do design reviews, walk down my checklist here. Get a group of people in the room, ask them to make predictions about uh, uh, what the code uh, uh, does. Uh, walk down and say, does it uh, meet the warranty of merchantability? Is it fit for its intended uh, uh, use? How many of you learned something new tonight? Fantastic. All right. I'll, they haven't kicked me out yet, although a couple of you are now zipping your jackets. So I have to mention drugs. I promised you drugs. <laughs> it turns up, if you look up phases of drug trials, there's actually, depending on the kind of drug, different phases. So I actually had a hard time finding this one. But this is the one I first learned about, which is phase one, find the uh, uh, safest dose and along the way, identifying uh, the side effects and the most effective way to deliver the drug. Never volunteer for a phase one study. <laughs> Seriously. You're going to get a uh, dose of uh, five cc's. You'll get a dose of two cc's. You'll get a one. You'll get a half cc. And if you die, we'll know it was too much if you don't get cured. <laughs> Not kidding, the purpose of this one is to find the safest dose. And they find it out by going over and under. Somebody is going to suffer the safest way to deliver the drug. You're getting a shot. You're getting a pill. You're getting a, a forced head. You've got other orifices. <laughs> 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 I, 
identifying side effects. Hey, we've got this little drop that we put in your eye that we think is going to reduce ocular uh, uh, pressure and uh, 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 help you with glaucoma. Doesn't that sound useful? Turned out it wasn't particularly good at that. It had a side effect. It caused your eyelashes to grow like crazy. <laughs> What's it called? Oh, come on. Not Rogaine. <laughs> the guys won't know this, but the ads are on all the women's magazines. Every woman's magazine has some full page ad with giant ass eyelashes for Latisse. Latisse started out as a glaucoma uh, a drug. It uh, and Whoa. got approved later for an eyelash growing cosmetic uh, uh, drug. <laughs> the side effect is sometimes what you want. It has another side effect. If you have blue eyes and don't want blue eyes, it cures that. So uh, Latisse is mainly favored by people who have brown eyes because they will stay uh, brown. Otherwise, it'll change your eye color. So the transform dict, its side effect was spades and speed overhead, and it breaks some dictionary invariants, and the missing method was not supported. I only learn these side effects not by looking at the code. I learned the side effects by trying it on people and seeing what happened to them. I gave them different dosages, let them solve different problems. I assigned learners. Here, come up with the use case for this, code the use case, et cetera. And then phase two, how well does the treatment work against uh, a, uh, a specific disease? And it turned out for the original use case, it worked really well. However, where people want an alternative dictionary type like a counter or default dict, it wasn't possible to use. There were a broad category of use cases to where this drug didn't teach, treat that disease. So this one is a fail. And then phase three, this one's quite important. It actually doesn't matter whether something works or not. What matters is, is it better than existing uh, solutions? So there are drugs that would have been approved in the uh, 60s that would never be approved today. It is widely believed that today, aspirin would not be approved because we have so many good, effective painkillers that the side effects of aspirin, the toxicity, what it does to your stomach and whatnot, uh, it wouldn't have risen to the level of being as good as what uh, uh, the uh, other drugs can do for you. So for phase three, here was people's assignment. Find something you think the transform dict is good for and code it. Then code it without the transform dict. And we put it on the screen side by side and say which one is better. So here's a simple synonym example. We have a dictionary that says the word flee maps to flee, so does surrender, so does give up. There are three ways to say flee in my uh, game. You talk, negotiate, and bargain mean the same thing. So this computes canonical values in a role-playing game. So I want to know if a transform dict is fit for this. Here's how you code it. The outcome is a transform dict where we take the alias dictionary and feed in get item as a fit uh, as the uh, uh, transformation function. And then here's the key value pairs. So here's what happens. If you flee, you lose all your we uh, weapons and points, but live to fight another day. If you fight, you die in a glaze of glory, but they sing songs in your honor. And if you talk, you'll be captured while negotiating and are never seen again. <laughs> Typical RPG. So you're placed with three Nelsigans who have wronged you, but you are in the right. You're challenge they challenge you to defend your honor. What do you do? So a person inputs their uh, action, and we display an outcome. So very simple little uh, RPG. Easy enough? So this code basically looks okay. I don't see anything wonderful wrong with it, anything wrong with it, except I don't really like this. I don't know why it is. I throw around uh, dunder methods like they're nothing, but a lot of people feel very icky about passing in a, uh, a bound uh, a dunder method. So that part isn't exactly great, but the use of this looks perfectly good. Given an action, look up an outcome. Does that make sense to you? So it's working reasonably well, but that's not the question. That's a phase two question. Phase three question, is it better than an existing solution? So what we would do is say, what would you do? A user inputs an action, we find out the alias for that action, and then look up the corresponding outcome. I will leave it to you to decide which one of these two is easier to debug. Which one of them is clear? Which one will throw predictable exceptions? Which one would you want to trace through a debugger? If you take this one through PDB, you're going to go all through the internals of a transform dict. If you ta take this one through PDB, it just does two dictionary lookups. 
This one has methods that people don't know, like get item, and it has unpredictable outcome for items. This one has is complete normal dictionaries, which means day one Python programmers can use it. What is your vote? Transform dict way or regular way? How many of you say uh, transform dict way? There's no wrong answers here. How many of you say the uh, regular way? So this is what phase three trials are all about. They're very important and the drug manufacturers have taught us something. And so I've uh, summarized the conclusions here. I'm now racing that blinking uh, uh, light so that we can uh, uh, let people clean up. The scrub postal example uh, address is, here's the occupants. So here's an address. By the way, the address is at least slightly wrong. I don't actually live there. And Terry Pratchett is no longer with us and Luther Blissett was never with us. Okay, so the names have been changed to protect the guilty. And so these are addresses and a person. Now a police officer has a report of a person at, at a suspicious location. And the suspicious location is reported like this. Notice that mansion has been spelled incorrectly, court has been spelled out, apartment's been spelled out, Santa Clara has been smushed together, Calif is a weird abbreviation, etc. We want to know, given a function called scrub address, which we actually pay an actual price for, I've got a link to where you can go to scrub your addresses, so you pay them money, it has some runtime cost to it, so it's not cheap, is the transform dict fit for this? So here's how you do it with a transform dict. Scrub address is a transformation function, and we pass in this list uh, dictionary of occupants up here. And then that gives us a dictionary who is at a particular address. Easy enough? Then we type in the suspect's, suspect's address, and we ask who's there. It gives us a suspect, and we can tell them who there is, and we can look up what their first reported alias was, how they reported themselves. So this is a police department uh, uh, example, and it's a real example. I've seen it in actual code when I assign people to actually go use it. Fair enough? All right, so does it work? In fact, it does work. There's things that we don't like about it though. One thing that was interesting that emerged from this is these addresses had already been scrubbed. They had been paid for. And they didn't have a few of them. They started with a list of over a million addresses. So what happened when you fed it in here? Interestingly, it went and re-scrubbed them all. You paid for another million addresses. The runtime creation of this took over an hour and cost thousands of dollars. How many of you consider that to be a design defect? Okay, the next one is we knew what we wanted the uh, uh, dictionary to be named. However, we now have two layers of dictionary, so it had to be called uh, who is at. All right, and interestingly, you can't get the scrubbed addresses back out of the dictionary, which is a problem because you just ran it at an hour of runtime and a thousand bucks for it. So this is the existing solution. We make suspect address, scrub address, look up the occupant, print them out, and print their address. One normal dictionary lookup, one function call. So this is really a question of orthogonality. Are these, is the scrub function best when combined with the dictionary into a single entity, or are they best as two separate entities? Is it best with helicopter controls, or is it best with car controls? Okay, and so we find some immediately evident in, uh, uh, issues. We can't report the scrub address. It always gives just first reported, which is not an interesting value for us. It calls the REST API for every address. I guess it was 2 million calls just to instantiate the uh, dictionary. So based on the phase three trials, what do you think? So the summary, this was not my summary. Remember, I taught this in classes. I taught people to do design reviews uh, and I told them that their vote was going to count. And in the end, they put, uh, wrote their summaries on the wall. So a lady named Patricia in one of my classes she summarizes like this. It, uh, I left out the part where she said, it's kind of cool and interesting, but there's a learning curve to be climbed to uh, figure out what it does. It takes a while to learn this, and it takes a while to figure out what the applications are. But when you try the same thing with only a plain dictionary, it's basic knowledge. You can do it with day one Python. And I thought this was an excellent summary. 
not only did I think it was an excellent summary, it was a summary that I was not able to see myself when I first looked at the transform data. I already knew how it worked. Most of these questions did not occur to me. I could have easily made the wrong judgment and approved it and put it in, and you all would be suffering with it today. So, is usability in uh, testing important? How many of you learned a number of considerations and some techniques for doing it? It is my goal that after this presentation, you're able to replicate this process for things that uh, um, uh, matters. I summarized all the issues here. Here's the formal rejection of it on uh, a Python dev, which I felt terrible about. I got only one response. Quito said, thank you for the detailed analysis. I really like how you did usability testing on actual real users. Not a single person other than that ever said a word. Is usability testing a thankless job? <laughs> Is it an important job? Thank you very much. I hope you all enjoyed the surprise presentation uh, this evening. Uh, how many of you thought it was worth a couple hours of your time? Fantastic. I will tweet out shortly a link uh, uh, to this. My uh, Twitter account is listed here at the beginning, Raymond H. Uh, please follow me. I teach Python over Twitter. I give you lots of tips and uh, uh, many lessons through uh, uh, Twitter. It's not that I need more Twitter followers. It just gives me a way to talk to you. So follow me on uh, Raymond H. And I'll send you the, uh, the slides tonight. Thank you so much for inviting you here. Thank you, LinkedIn. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. All right. Should we I get think, out? Yeah, I think we'll skip questions so people okay. can go find him. You want to talk real quick? Oh, yeah. right. Grace, stay for one minute. Grace has something to say important. One minute. So how many knows about Pi Bay? Yeah, a few of you guys. So the, uh, it's basically the regional version of Python conference. And this is the second year that we're having it. It's on the second weekend of August. There are a few people, actually more than a few people, that have gone to last year's Pi Bay and I believe enjoyed it. Yeah? <laughs> um, so I'm really happy to announce that your favorite speaker over here will be keynoting um, this year's Pi Bay. As well, he is going to be doing a four-day workshop um, the day preceding um, the conference. So I would invite you all to look him up. And last year, his workshop sold out. And so hopefully this year, he will also sell One out. last request. Yeah? If you use Twitter, do do a tweet out uh, about tonight. The only way my wife knows how I did tonight is she watches all the tweets as you make them. <laughs> Not kidding. There you go. <laughs> Let's not wrap more of his time. And thank you so much. Do go to Pi Bay and look it up. And this, this is going to be a great idea to have this as a, as a tradition in the Bay Area. So we can all have our own conference here instead of going to PyCon, which is always sold out. So thank you so much. And, and also thank Jeff for organizing this. I know how much work it is. So thank you. Thank you, organizers. Thank you. And last thanks again to LinkedIn for hosting us. And uh, good night. <laughs>